Ladies and gentlemen, break the chair. I was the age of nine, I believe, I ended up picking up my first instrument, which was for my dad. He gave me an acoustic guitar, which I, I have no idea what the name of it is at this point. I just know that thing was old, and it was handed down a couple generations in the family. And my mom or dad were not really musicians, he just owned this one thing. And, uh, we used to basically play on it like, you know, at the age of nine, it was just like anything else, like a toy or something like that. My first showed her interest in music probably when I would say I was about five or six, you know. Um, my dad was in a band at the time called Damn Dirty Ape. Kind of got me a lot into music at that point. Um, I'm a drummer, my dad's a drummer, and as you can imagine, he kind of got me into drumming and I've been drumming ever since, you know. At the, at the current time, like, I didn't really have any major musical influences. I think between like 9 and 12, I started to really uh, get somewhat interested in uh, Aerosmith and a couple other little bands, but I, I never like really like focused that heavily on music, I think, until the age of, I would say, late 12, when I uh, got to see my uncle's band live and I saw their bass play the rock and they started tearing up the bass. You guys, so interested in uh, an instrument for some reason. I, I can't tell you why. I guess some people are just drawing the same thing. So I just be something about it. I knew that it was a bass. So I ended up getting one for my birthday when I turned 13. I used to jam on that thing all the time. I never took any lessons or anything. I could play for shit. I used to always keep it. I, mean, I, I learned a couple of things here and I just want to keep it enough. Watching videos and watching people play, but for the most part, I played for fun, and I think that's what most of us did. As a band, we first we first got together probably 1999, 2000. We just started jamming, we started jamming with my cousin Mike, and we ended up staying a band actually trying to like, you know, harvest some ability to really play our instruments. And Tom ended up acquiring a real drum set, Andy acquired an actual guitar, Matt acquired an actual guitar with an amp, little Marshall amps. And we jammed and we wrote a couple songs. And, uh, at that point, I think we started really getting into Metallica, which I think was uh, a friend of Tommy's ended up kind of showing us some of the tunes. They're all just Anyway, you know, some of them. I was obsessed with them when they started. I remember buying almost all their CDs, some of the course in a couple months. I was jamming them, and there was nobody in the town. I had shirts, I had hats, I mean, I had Metallica. I was just obsessed with these guys. Now, at the time, I really wasn't huge into heavy metal, but he really got me showing big interest in that. I mean, we started jamming a lot. And that was something we did on the side. Me and him just jammed along with Andy, he learned all the Metallica cover songs, you know, like Remember the Bell Tolls, Enter Sandman, um, Sanitarium, One, I mean, you name it, we were playing everything. started writing a few songs, it wasn't anything spectacular, but I mean, we were young and we were having a good time, so we pumped out a couple little demo tapes and 
we just really, I guess, decided to start taking it a little bit seriously. I mean, it's still, it sounds extremely young, but I, I, at the age of like, I had to have been like, it was, you know, it was like later that year when I was like the age of 13, we really wanted to like make a real band out of this and really keep pumping music out. And uh, my art teacher, I think I gave her a CD and she did that a lot of interest and she ended up doing some form of uh, school thing over at the uh, mall, at the street from us, which is the Defer Mall. And uh, she actually had us play there. And that was considerably the first game we had to perform. And that was, that was cool, we had a bunch of kids watching us. I was supposed to be the vocalist of the band, but I chickened out that day and would not sing. You can imagine a lot of people's reactions hearing a metal band in the friggin' mall when they're trying to shop, but, you know, it was fun. And I think, from that point, we did a couple of house parties, and just little stuff, family stuff, and we got the ability, like, we started being able to play, like, some, like, town little town festivals and things here and there. We just, I, th I think it was more or less our age, like Matt was the youngest one in the band. It was the age of uh, eight, I think, when we were actually going on doing shows. And I think the age of the band really, you know, grabbed the interest of people and got us, like, landed us a bunch of these little gigs. Before we started hitting them gigs, we changed the name from Dark Flags Band. Because we just didn't, well, number one, we didn't didn't feel it, I guess, and uh, we found out there's a band called Black Flag, and uh, it's a good band, by the way. And we, you know, we didn't want to like copy off of anybody, so we, we went weeks, I remember, trying to figure out a band name, and uh, the inception of the name Break the Chair goes as follows, and uh, what happened was I was over at my cousin's house, and I was leaning back on their computer chair, just like stressing over, like, I don't know what we're gonna name the band. And my aunt walked in, just like, stop leaning on the chair, you're gonna break the chair. And for some reason, I thought that was really stupidly funny. And I was just like, haha, break the chair, that'd be a good band name until we come up with something better. Needless to say, the band name is still Break the Chair to this day. A couple years later, about I'd say a year after, we um, actually got the chance to interview on WMMR. We did a Metallica medley. It was like Inner Sandman, Master of Puppets, Nothing Else Matters, Sad But True. It's a whole medley of like seven, eight songs we did. And we actually got a chance to meet like Raz at the time was the DJ there. Come in and do like an interview and stuff. That was pretty cool. They actually played it on air and interviewed us, which I thought was really cool. Like, I mean, I still think it's really cool to this day. I haven't had a chance to do that since you know age. And the uh, guy was a real nice guy. I remember people were calling in, like, asking about us. I just, it was awesome. Oh my goodness. Christmas in the jungle. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> we sent a message to Metallica probably a week prior to the show, maybe two weeks prior. And this was back in 2004, October, probably the first week or second week of October, because the Metallica show was October 19th and October 20th. My aunt wrote a letter in to Metallica themselves. She sent it to their management. Just huge long thing just explaining how much they influenced us and how it kept us from being a bunch of little bastards and kept us off the street and shit and just let let us, you know, really have something to look forward to and really focus on and have a goal set in life. And James Hetfield actually ended up receiving the letter from management, James Hetfield, the singer of Metallica, and he told them to invite us to come meet them for the first of two nights that they were coming in Philly, which was, I think, a month later. I still remember coming home that day from school, and uh, my mom telling me that, and I, I thought she was completely screwing with me. And I almost did not believe it was true until we were actually backstage that day, and I, it was just unbelievable. We got to stand backstage, and 
Pierre Robert, who is one of the number one DJs in WMMR. I remember we were standing back there with a bunch of uh, those contest winners that were doing meet and greets with Metallica. And Pierre interviewed us, and we ended up having that interview on MMR also. People were just all around asking us questions. It was it was really cool. Like, you know, the fact that we were so young and you know, our age like really influenced Metallica. Like the fact that we were just getting into this music gig at such a young age. I think it's great. And so back to the Metallica story. We were backstage, and we ended up meeting all the members of the band. And we had our instruments, and they signed all our stuff. I got a snare drum head signed, and he got a BC Rich. Warlock guitar, and Mike had his Schechter bass, I believe. Yeah, Schechter. Uh, Kirk Hammett actually let uh, Andy, our guitarist, play Master of Poppins for him, which is, is awesome. Like, and he's just like in love with it. I thought that was it, man. I, I met Metallica. They signed my instruments, I got to take pictures with them. I, I felt like life didn't matter at that point. Like, it, 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 whatever the hell happened, you know, I'd be pretty damn happy with it. Went out. Got to watch their show. They played almost every song that I wanted to hear. I went to bed. Next morning, I wake up. Bunch of screaming, borderline crying from my mom. First thought in my head was like, what the hell happened? Who's in the hospital or something? She told me, get up, get out of bed. And uh, that's when she told me that Metallica's management called, said that we want them, they wanted us to come backstage, hang out with them for the day, and then later in the day for this was for their second show in Philly. Go on stage and play Seek and Destroy with them. And we did. And they gave us a dressing room. We got to watch them rehearse. We got to rehearse with and them. Here we are. And, I mean, the room, there's not too much to really say except for the fact that it is still to this day. Uh, single be most uh, amazing cool. experience that I've had in my life. It's incredible to be able to do something like that. You know, this is your dressing room. Why don't you just take your shirt off and put it back on so we can say that we use the room as a dressing room. <laughs> Go, guys. Go ahead, Andy. Step. Andy, take your shirt off. No. Take your shirt off and put it back on. Go ahead, Matt. Take your shirt off and put it back on. <laughs> this is the dressing room. I Somebody, <laughs> Somebody's got to get dressed. everybody out of here pretty quick. Like Somebody guys get dressed. At, well, Oh, you know what? You took your shoes off, so technically that counts. Because you got to put your shoes back on, so.
15 minutes of fame, it was, it was great. Playing in front of 20,000 people, they let us do the opening riff of Seek and Destroy, and after the show, we get to hand out picks, and Tommy get to throw out some drumsticks, and uh, I still have a ton of their picks now, I've got 50 of them in the case. And it's just a memory that I would cherish forever. It's just something that I can, if I'm having a rough day, I can always just look back and think about that. And it just puts me in a good mood. It's just something that so much done thousands of You know what I mean? There's millions of people that want to do something like that. And the fact that, you know, I had the ability to do that with my band, I love. And I'm not trying to sound conceited or anything. I think it's an act that I deserve it. I'm just very grateful that it happened. They're really talkative, aren't they? <laughs> no, they're probably going. Oh, I was wondering what's going on. I got it on my that's, yeah. what, that's what I kept saying that's all day. I, I can't imagine what they're thinking. thinking. It's just another rehearsal. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you weren't playing in the basement. That's for sure, or in the backyard, or a oh, that's social cool. event, or. They're happy. They got paid. They got paid in picks. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Well, it was cool. Yeah, what do you guys? We can't thank you enough. Oh my, really. we don't even know what the you guys. You made their their life. I'm telling you. Oh, oh my gosh. Inspiring for us, you know. Like we we love having you out today. Yeah. Well, have a good time, guys. Good luck with the rest of your stuff. Alrighty. You too, man. Michael. Have a good one, man. It was, it was really cool. So keep playing and play because you want to, not because you have to. You know? That's it. You know? Yes. That's the way we do it. I don't, I don't do say, hey, it's time for practice. We don't do that at all. I let them do it whenever they want, and this way they, they stay interested, you know? That's the way we do it. At that point, I really thought, like, in my mind, like, we might actually make it. Even though we weren't amazing musicians, you know, I always knew that maybe the age would carry us or something like that. I'd say back in early 2005, about a year after, we were all recording record? on some new songs and we recorded yeah, baby, here we go. a three-song demo with my dad's friends, Dino, yeah, here we go. Well, from Double D Productions at the time. And this was actually in his house in his basement. You know, he had all of the Pro Tools, Logic, um, Awesome Mac, everything, soundproof rooms, you name it. All the cool stuff that I wish I had what, still to this yeah, day. What song you guys start we recorded with? three songs. Never Seen, The Beast, Never seen? and Nothing More. Yeah. That was like our first three songs we were really working on at the time. He let us record a three song demo for free with him, and he really helped me uh, I don't know, throw a pair of balls and like just sing. Because I was dead afraid to do it, and he helped me try and create melodies and shit like that. It was a cool little demo that we did. It was three songs that we've had are lying around here and there. And uh, from that point, we got to play all different venues. Uh, we got to co-headline a show at the Trocadero because we sold a bunch of tickets. We played Kahunaville in Delaware, which I think is closed down now. And uh, all different little places. Uh, we had a lady that was uh, kind of being our... Uh, I don't know what you would call it, I guess, like a local tour manager or something. Who, she was booking her shows all over the place for a little while. And it was, it was really cool. I mean, we, we had a nice little fan base. And I was going into high school. And, I mean, this was between like going into high school and 11th grade and all these little things were going on. And I was just on a, I was just on a little high like the whole time. I just, it was music, it was right the chair. That's My focus was on nothing but that. It was hard for me to even focus in school because all I wanted to do was be a rock star. I just really, really was hoping, praying all the time that it would happen. From that point, things started to kind of, kind of die down a little bit, I guess you could say, in terms of uh, the uh, local famous, like, local, yeah, just being somewhat locally like famous, which I think is, I can't think of anything else to describe it as. It's, it sounds extremely, extremely like, big-headed and like fooling myself to say something like that, but just on a local level, like a lot of people know us, and we just did all these like cool little gigs. I had a lot of fun doing it. You know, 
Uh, we recorded Bound by Aggression. We started recording that probably 2007 into 2008. Got done like late 2008. Well, this was our first full record CD. And it was a culmination of all the songs we wrote over the course since I was 13. So it was 10 songs. And I, I mean, I'm proud that we did the album. I'm really happy that we ended up releasing those songs. And uh, there was some tension at the time during it. I was kind of becoming a, an asshole, I guess you could say, in terms of, I guess, you know, going between the ages of 16 and 19, I felt like, you know, I was old enough to make some big decisions in terms of the music and in terms of booking shows and in terms of the recording and stuff. And I kind of bumped heads with my uncle pretty bad about that stuff. And, Mainly because of me. And it was just, I don't know, I guess I try to be an independent person sometimes, and I take it a little bit too far. I, don't know, I, I forget that people are just trying to lend a hand as opposed to having control of the band. But we pushed through. We made the album. I, we did the vocals. Uh, I, I did them the best I possibly could with no uh, vocal training or coaching. And it came out good, and my uncle did an incredible job at mixing it for the first time, never doing anything like that before. It couldn't have been any better, and I'm extremely proud of that album to this day, and I still give it to people if they ask me to. That was definitely a fun CD to record. That really helped me get better at recording, that CD. I learned from the first one, and this one was kind of like the CD that made me like so comfortable recording and being able to play the click tracks and things like that. So, um, a couple years later, after playing a bunch of shows all over the place, we um, broke up as a band. I mean, I guess subconsciously I started to realize that maybe all the dreams that I was hoping for wasn't going to end up coming true because all the shows that we were doing were starting to die down. Uh, we pumped the album out, not too much happened afterwards. And, uh, the band, you know, I was getting into college, and uh, Tommy was in college, and I guess, you know, I started bumping heads with the guys. I tried to form a lot of control. and while we were like starting the writing process for another CD and it just it just kind of hit a little bit of a rough patch and uh, I ended up not wanting to do a band with them anymore. So I, I ended up leaving for a while. And, uh, it was really tough, really tough for me because of the fact that we were all family and I remember going to family parties and stuff and how awkward it was because I felt really bad for making a decision like that. I still feel bad about the way I approached that kind of thing. Just going and taking my equipment and just kind of bailing out, saying the songs are rude of mine, and that is the end of it. And it's a very asshole move to do, you know, and it was just a lot of shit going on in my head, and I just didn't want to do it anymore, and me and Tommy really weren't getting along. And I, uh, a lot of, a lot of different things. There was a whole culmination of all different things. I mean, it's, I wasn't, it wasn't just me like being an asshole or anything. We just all had our differences. And uh, the best I can say at that point is it's, it's behind us and I'm happy that uh, we ended up patching things up. And every now and then I would get together with Tom and we would just jam, play some of the songs that I wrote, played some of the songs he wrote. And they ended up pumping out three songs they recorded and they showed me. Three songs they Words. blew me away. I thought they were great. Such a change from the uh, the, old, the old older stuff, and I, re I really was like proud of them. And I, was, I wasn't gonna try and force myself back into the band, and I did it. I really thought, you know, this, this is good for them. And I'm happy that they're doing this. And I ended up joining a band as a bass player for a little while, um, which was kind of signed, and I mean, I was, I guess, like, I always had the mindset, like, maybe I just need to 
try different projects until I find the right one because I still wanted to be a rock star. I still wanted to be able to have the ability to make it, you know what I mean? And just play music and I was in bands playing shit that I hated. Like just music that I despised, but I just did it because I wanted to be able to obtain that dream. And I think that's when I really kind of lost my connection with the importance of music in my life. And I just kind of ended up focusing more on me and not the people around me that wanted to play, just to play. Needless to say, I left the band. Jam with Tom a few times here and there, and we ended up getting back together. When we reformed, our guitarist Matt decided, I guess, that music really wasn't his thing, which completely respect, you know. And he's doing his own thing right now. He's focusing on school, and he's got a he's got a big life ahead of him. And I can tell he does, regardless if it's with music or without. Music. So we didn't play for about a year. Probably about a year and a half, I would say, until we got together again back in 2011. And we decided, you know what, we're going to take a break from shows and just start writing more songs. So we got a nice solid amount of songs together, about 11 or 12 songs, and decided we were going to record a new full-length CD. So I decided I, I moved from bass and I went to guitar and vocals and ended up having my brother join in. And uh, he was always playing instruments on the side and uh, just doing little things here and there. And he was in he was in a couple bands with me at uh, on the side. And uh, putting him in the band was really cool because me and him are we click really well musically. And uh, me and Tom and Andy and Nick like just overall like it's a really good group of of guys like just trying to have a good time. <laughs> Someone to take the hearts and night and let it go. They never this CD was definitely a lot heavier than our previous CDs. A lot more double bass, more different time signatures. I walk alone! Twice. It was tough getting used to like recording these songs, but it's definitely a lot of fun. Definitely one of my favorite CDs we have working on, and it's expected to be done early 2014, probably March or April. I'm hoping to have it done by. <laughs> excited about this CD. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it. It's definitely a lot different from our The music's stuff. not thrash, Metallica type stuff. It's more it's more our own sound and I think for all of us we could say that it's, it's more meaningful to us. You can tell there's a lot of feeling behind everything. And it doesn't matter at this point to me if we make it or not or it's just I want to be able to just play music with these guys, they, they're important to me.